My name is Jillian Sneed, and I am Assistant Professor of Art History um, in the School of Art and Design here at San Diego State University. I want to welcome you to today's panel titled Indigenous Ecologies, which seeks to explore ecology and the environment, indigenous perspectives on land and nature, and, indig and uh, the indigenous struggle for land rights, and the relationship between the Amazon rainforest, climate change, and deforestation, and the rainforest indigenous populations. This panel is one of the programs organized as part of my curated exhibition, The Imaginary Amazon, currently on view in the University Art Gallery. After this panel ends, I hope you will join me um, in the gallery at around 3.30 for a reception and guided exhibition tour. In addition to being related to my exhibition, this panel is also a part of the Arts Alive Discovery Series. I would like to thank Arts Alive Chair Arzu Ozkal and Public Affairs and Communication Specialist Elizabeth Allison for their help and support in organizing today's panel. I also want to thank Chantal Paul of the University Art Gallery, Tina Yapelli, Director of the School of Art and Design, and Crystal Bivona and Erica Rob Larkins of the Boehner Stiefel Center for Brazilian Studies for their support as well. I also acknowledge and thank our, um, our simultaneous translators today, Diego uh, Sarayiva and Simone Lima. And I will now introduce our moderator and our panelists. So our moderator today is on the far end, Kenny. Kenny Ekundayo is an MA candidate in SDSU's MA in Liberal Arts and Sciences program, where she is currently completing her MA thesis entitled Retelling the Story of Place, Aestheticizing the Double Jeopardy of Flooding in Brazil and Nigeria. Kenny is an independent art curator who has curated many international exhibitions, most recently the first comprehensive survey of Nigerian artist Bruce Onobrakpea that took place in SDSU's University Art Gallery in 2022. Kenny's work has been profiled widely in the media, including CNN, KPBS, Curtin Magazine, TVC, and The Guardian, to name a few. At SDSU, Kenny has also served as a teaching assistant for several art history courses, including um, those of you who are in contemporary art of Latin America. She is RTA this semester, and she has TA'd in a number of art history courses. And she's also the managing editor at the SDSU University Press. This fall, she will be joining the art history doctoral program at Stanford University. Our panelists today are Denilson Baniwa, Dr. Miranda Chase, and Dr. Eliani Gomez Alves. Unfortunately, Jacob Alvarado Waipuk cannot join us today. Denilson Baniwa is an artist included in the Imaginary Amazon exhibition, and we see him here zooming in from Brazil on screen. He is an indigenous Brazilian artist who was born in the village of Dari in the Rio Negro, Amazonas, and is currently based in Niteroi, Rio de Janeiro. In his art, he borrows images from colonial archives and appropriates the visual language of Western pop culture imagery in order to decolonize these images and reorient their significations. He is also an activist for the rights of indigenous peoples and has held lectures, workshops, and courses on this topic since 2015. He has been included in numerous international exhibitions, including most recently at the Getty Center here in Southern California in Los Angeles, had an amazing show um, that I got to see at the Getty um, last fall, um, as well as the Kuntala Vien in Vienna, the Pinacoteca do Estado de São Paulo in 2020, the Museo Giarchi de São Paulo in 2020, and the Sydney Biennial in 2020, among many, many, many other exhibitions. And upcoming for Denilson in April this year at the 60th Venice Biennial, he has been appointed a co-curator of the Brazilian Pavilion, which will be renamed Ha Ha Pua Pavilion and will be opening in April. Miranda Chase at Center is an assistant professor of political science at SDSU. She received her PhD from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, with a dissertation titled Damming Sustainability, How Social and Environmental Networks Influence the Construction and Management of Large Dams in the Amazon Basin. Her, um, she is an environmental governance scholar specializing in the Amazon region. Her research occurs at the intersection of political science, economic sustainability, climate change, Latin American, and environmental studies. For more than 10 years, she has been working in the Brazilian Amazon with indigenous and traditional communities. She embraces the role of an engaged academic in her research, and her research is demand-driven, 
meaning that she works in close collaboration with local communities in the Amazon and also other actors involved with environmental government, governance in the region in order to determine what should be the focus of her research projects. Currently, she is working on a new project on illegal mining operations. This project investigates the political economy of mineral commodities and how the international market is driving the expansion of such operations. And then lastly, we have Eliane Gomez Alves here on the end, who is a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Germany and a collaborator in the graduate program in climate and environment at the National Institute for Amazonian Research, or INPA, in Brazil. She is currently serving as visiting faculty here on, um, on SDSU's campus, and she is our sustainability fellow in the SDSU Boehner Stifel Center for Brazilian Studies. She obtained her PhD in climate and environment at INPA in 2016, and her entire research career has been developed in forest atmosphere interaction research in the Amazon. She is interested in investigating how plants, mainly trees, respond to the climate in primary forests in central Amazonia and disturbed forests in the Amazon arc of deforestation, where environmental extremes such as heat and drought are becoming more frequent. She has been part of several international projects, collaborations to carry out research in the Amazon. In addition to her scientific research, she devotes time to developing activities that impact teaching, mentoring, diversity, and inclusion. Moreover, she is founder of the Latin America Early Career Earth System Scientist Network, a network to empower Latin Americans in the international scientific community. So we will now have a land acknowledgement provided to us by um, Elizabeth Allison, after which um, Danilson will speak to us a little bit about his culture's um, perspectives on these themes. And then we will have a conversation with the panelists led by our moderator, followed by um, an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay. Ok, Denilson, agora queremos a sua apresentação. that 
life creates in the places we live, the places that we share. Therefore, for the Maniwa people and for many other indigenous people of the Brazilian Amazon, the, this ecological meaning or this word the environment or the concept of the Amazon, it's uh, something that is ancestral. It comes before human beings. Everything that was created was created by our ancestors and then is shared by those who stay here. Human beings, non-human beings, such as plants, other animals, other living beings. So the concept of ecology for the Beniwa people has a very wide scope of in this understanding of life, but also very micro in the sense that everything is a part of a single system. So for instance, we can't talk about the protection of the forest as something that's far from us. Let us protect trees for us. We don't understand that. Let's protect the trees. The protection of a tree in a forest or, or of another specific living being is the protection of ourselves as a part of who we are in that place. So much so that for the Maniwa people, the issue of family relation goes beyond blood ties. So you might have an aunt that's a tree, or you might have an uncle who is the river itself. So taking care of the environment or taking care of protecting life in the Amazon is taking care of who we are and of the ancestral heritage of our forebears who have created uh, this world. Therefore, we are all interconnected and we are all part of what we call the Amazon rainforest. The Baniwa people is, are connected to all the beings who exist in that territory. So ecology for us means that, taking care of our lives and of who we are because we're integrated with all the different beings who live in this same territory. Therefore, the threat coming from mining, deforestation, contamination of rivers and the advance of cities over the forest is not only violence against the trees or the non-human animals, but a violence against us. So this is why we need to take care of all of this. And everything that stems from this violence against us as beings who live in the, this territory, it impacts all sorts of life. what we call climate change, for instance. Last year, we had a, a very violent occasion in the, in the region that I lived in, which was a huge drought, in which all the different beings who live in that region were, didn't have the conditions for their basic survival. Correct survival. And this had never happened. There was a huge drought, and it made communities, uh, it, it made transit between communities very hard because it was through the river, so our festivals couldn't be held. We couldn't go to our uh, farmlands and we couldn't take care of our territories because the drought was so intense that our movement 
and communication between the, our different uh, villages was very tough at that point. So that's just one example of how climate change, as we discussed, have reached that region. As an artist and other indigenous peoples of my region who are also artists, we constantly have tried to connect the Western world to our reality saying in the same way that the West understands life on the planet, we also have our thought, our way, means of thinking about life on the planet and it's a connection between ancestrality and the current reality and for that we need to understand how these territories were built, how they were inhabited, how they were how human plants and and other beings were came to be in relationship and then we will be able to have the consciousness of what is ecology in the region. These, this is some of our work that I developed a few years ago trying to show what we understand as ecology in the region where I, I was born on the frontier, on the border between Brazil and Colombia in the Amazon um, forest. And these drawings show the connection between all the beings in a territory. They are not dissociated. One being is not dissociated from another there is nothing that is larger or smaller in terms of importance. So these were the words I had. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daniel Singh, for that very enlightening presentation. And um, I'd like to guide us to our next question, um, uh, Miranda and Eliani. You've heard, you know, what Danielson has to say on um, not just his earliest memories of, of ecological consciousness, but what it means, you know, that word ecology, what it means to the Baniwa people, and by extension to um, a lot of, you know, ecologic, um, indigenous communities, um, across the Latin Americas. Um, so I, I would like to know what indigenous ecologies, you know, the term means to you, how it's surfaced in your work, how you deal with it, you know, on a daily or periodical basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for, for being here and thank you Jolly, for organizing. It's an honor to be in this panel. And, and thank you very much um, for the Nelsonia. It's, it's an absolute honor to, even if it's remotely, to be on a panel with you. Um, I, I think the Nelson put it so beautifully that I couldn't try to provide a different definition. Um, indigenous ecologies is what indigenous peoples have known and practiced and what we are trying to learn. Um, we who grew up with the Western science and the Western model of, of operating, we were told for hundreds of years in, in the Western cultures that um, people or men were separate from nature and that there was a, a divide in there that was a divide that was, that was putting people above nature and um, that nature was something to be used and conquered for the benefit of men and the people who were trying to reach something that was originally at some point it was put as it was it was uh, the mission of God uh, and and I find that that version of separation is, is very distorted and it is very dysfunctional and it doesn't serve us um, and the version of indigenous ecologies that the Nelson provided is what we are now catching up to in, in science and in, in 
sociology and environmental justice, which is this idea that we are not separate from nature, that whatever we do to nature, uh, we're also doing to ourselves, and that protecting nature is, is the only way that we can learn how to function and exist in the world and thrive in different socio societies of different human beings that interact and coexist with animals and plants and all of that. So I, um, I couldn't put it any better. I would just put it in the, the way that we in the Western cultures have learned to um, think about indigenous ecologies. It's something that is new, and it's unfortunate that it's new. Uh, we, we grew up with with a culture that was, was telling us that we were separate. And now, thanks to many scientists, we are understanding that, yeah, that, that separation was actually something that we thought we could impose um, on, on us and on nature, but it was, it was manufactured by our minds um, and the material reality of our existence. And now science, the Western science is catching up to that, so we're actually much more connected than we thought we were. So I'll stop here, Pastor Giuliani. Thanks, everyone, uh, to come to this panel. Thanks, Julian, to invite me. Thanks, the Nielsen. It's also an honor for me to be in the same panel as you. I, I wish I could meet you in person, maybe next time. Um, I completely agree with Miranda, so I, I think uh, what the Nielsen said is amazing. So we are learning from them. Uh, I was completely uh, educated <laughs> with you know, Western system, so my science is completely Western science. And I, what, what I want to add is that it's very unfortunate that we still do science this way, even though we are like trying to be more open, to have these discussions, but there is still a lot of people that do this separation between ecology from the Western view, from what is like perceived or even thought by indigenous. For example, there is this misled uh, idea that the Amazon forest is pristine, that people were never there. But in fact, what we have in the Amazon forest is a long history of domestication of plants, made by the many civilizations that live there. So, and this is something that is being refused still by many scientists. And this idea of pristine forest, pristine forest is something that we are trying to uh, avoid, but only part of the scientific community is doing that. So yeah, I think today is a, a great uh, opportunity to rethink these things and to, to interact with different uh, communities. Thank you. Um, when you talk about the Amazon, I think one of the pictures that is painted, um, especially in this millennium, is Amazon, you know, the online oh, yeah. <laughs> commercial conglomerate or whatever you want to call it. But that's what comes to mind, especially for, I'm sure, a lot of people in the room today. and. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a threat to the actual Amazon, you know, and it forms one of the uh, exhibits displayed in the show, which I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, many, many of you will get to see after the panel, uh, the panel session ends. Um, so in the view of that, you know, we come to um, what stands as threat to this region, you know, and other regions of biodiversity or biodiverse regions, if you want to call it that. So um, for you all, you know, including Daniel Singh, um, what would you say is threatening the, this, this territories, these indigenous territories, and of course the livelihoods of the indigenous uh, people who live in the Amazon? Does Daniel want to go first? Uh, Daniel Singh, do you want to go first? Isolated as a single threat 
Because if that were the case, maybe it would be simple that we could unite our forces and, and fight that one single threat or enemy. There is a network of things, of threats, to life in, Amaz in the Amazon and in the planet as a general, so for example, as a, as a whole. So for example, the rise of en commercial enterprises, of huge conglomerates, which want to use our space, our territory, the, to plant monocultures. This is not just an issue in the Amazon or in the Cerrador, Brazilian savanna, or other Brazilian biomes, but I see that this is a pressure in the whole world. I was in Portugal recently, and um, agriculture, the traditional food crops are being substituted by eucalyptus, uh, crops. So we in Brazil we have big ag advancing with transgenic corn occupying huge <coughs> areas of land and to keep this kind of economy of commodities it's necessary to use a lot of pesticides and these pesticides are used in these crops and then they go to the rivers and that is where a lot of people are fishing or drinking from that water. They become uh, intoxicated by this, these poisons. And this also goes on to the everyday plate of people who are not indigenous. So there is a chain of, of uh, events that poison everyone's lives. And in the same way, mining, uh, the mining of the Amazon, beyond the destruction, erosion of our soil, destruction of a large part, so large swaths of our forest, but there's also contamination by heavy metals, by, for example, mercury. That's been an issue of, this has been poisoning and making many people uh, ill, not only of the indigenous peoples, but also other populations who live close to us. So these are big kinds of uh, industrial enterprises that are, are at a juncture of several of our issues. If we can try to identify one as the crux of the issue, it is the need, the human need for commerce, for enterprises that is held above the human need to live in a healthy way on this planet. Um, again, fully agree with what Nelson said. Um, I, um, I, uh, these material threats that uh, Denelson is talking about that are unfortunately absolutely real and immensely destructive, big ag, monoculture, mining, uh, and, and, and this need for commercial growth uh, that is it's really pushing all the industries that's behind that uh, is, is an immense threat. As a political scientist, that I'll, I'll wear that hat right now, um, I think that there's a few other things that I would like to bring into this conversation that might provide some food for thought for, for all of us, hopefully. Um, the fact that we have different preferences, that we have different perspectives on how is it that we should use the resources that we have at our disposal, how is it that we should use nature, how should we take care of it, how we should use our personal times and our abilities to pursue whatever is 
enjoyable and, and good for us in life, I would pose that it's something that ought to be respected. Uh, that it is something that it's, it's good that people have different preferences, that people have different goals, and that they have different ways of evaluating things. Uh, and therefore, if there are people in the world that believe uh, that they really, really want to mine or to do agriculture or whatever, I would say that those people in and of themselves are not necessarily the problem. What they are doing causes many problems to those of us that are against that and that don't support those activities. But yet those people still have the right to exist and to have their preferences and to try to pursue those preferences. What I would pose as being one of the absolute greatest threats that we have right now in Brazil for the Brazilian Amazon, for the indigenous and the traditional communities, for all of us Brazilians and everybody around the world, one of the largest threats that we have in the ecological frontier right now is lack of democracy. Uh, we do not have enough political systems that are sufficient to deliver protection and justice for minorities and a political system that arbitrates different preferences and, and, and different perspectives onto how is it that we should govern ourselves as societies. Uh, that lack of institutions that provide basic rights and, and justice to minorities and also allows for us to have different perspectives and different goals and different ways of measuring success and different ways of um, setting priorities for our societies is something that is immensely missing. It's missing in Brazil, it's missing in the US, it's missing almost everywhere around the world. That ability to talk across the aisle with people that don't agree with us, that want to do things that we think are evil things, mm -hmm. and uh, we do not have a political or institutional system that allows for us to have conversations with people that have different preferences. I am wholeheartedly with the Nilsson and the other indigenous and traditional communities I work with. And uh, I am also concerned about many of my colleagues who are environmentalists that are pushing this agenda that everybody needs to listen to this one version of ecological sustainability that is that they have found a light and that there is only one way to be sustainable on this planet and it, it, everybody needs to follow into that one cookie cutter model. That is incredibly problematic and it's not going to take us there. What indigenous peoples have been doing for millennia is that they have managed to create systems where they can coexist with other indigenous groups in a territory and they can figure out ways to settle their, their differences. Uh, in, in Western societies and in Western world, we, we've created something that's called democracy that doesn't work too well and we're losing it. Uh, the more we can invest in stronger democratic institutions, the more sustainable we could potentially become. So these are my two cents. <laughs> Well, I completely agree with you, Miranda, and also with the Nilsson. I just want to add another aspect of how the threats in the Amazon can scale to other regions outside the Amazon, and how what happened outside the Amazon can affect the Amazon as well. So when we when we investigate the interaction between Amazon and climate or climate change, one thing that is really important to consider is the scale. So, and this scale we can separate in spatial scale and temporal scale. So, thinking of a spatial scale, let's think of local. Lo if something like if a, a small area in the Amazon is just deforested, this has a local impact. But when we add the temporary scale, we're going to have, with time, the gradation of the forest that is around that gap. And this, if this scales up, with time, this will impact areas that, is, that are outside the Amazon. Why is that? Because 
deforestation leads to an increase of greenhouse gas emissions, which leads to global warming. So this is a local scale, like some from the Amazon, going outside the Amazon. But we are all emitting greenhouse gas all over the world, and this is leading to global warming. So this also is <laughs> warming the Amazon. So what we do outside is affecting the Amazon as well. So, of course, illegal mining, deforestation, all of these things that are happening in the Amazon are really bad. But what we are doing outside is also really bad. And if we want to have the main service of the Amazon to the climate, which is keeping the carbon in the air, and also the cooling effect that the Amazon has for the climate, we need to protect the forest, but we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Eliani. Um, as I say, charity begins at home, and um, a lot of times people outside these homes don't, um, they are not able to recognize those actions of, or acts of charity, if you want to call it that. Um, so I would like, you know, all three of you to maybe highlight certain actions that the indigenous communities in these regions, these biomes, um, what actions are they taking? I think we have um, uh, the international political system um, and how they are taking charge of this to fight for themselves, to you know, draw awareness um, to what is happening in their homeland or on their homeland and um, you know, pretty much fighting for themselves you know, how uh, just not, not just the, the Amazonian region, but other territories um, across the Americas. Uh, Danielson, do you want to go first? territories was a debate that many different indigenous people were uh, carrying out so that we could protect a large part of this territory against deforestation, against the invasion of large construction works and enterprises in that region and the war guaranteeing the life of the population that live in those places. Currently, the indigenous movement in Brazil was able to have, uh, was able to uh, fight for the creation of the Ministry of Indigenous People, which is a kind of alliance, so that ecological themes and other themes have. Uh, a voice being heard inside the Brazilian state. Beyond that, for a long time now, indigenous people have been organizing themselves and have went to large forums, events, to talk to institutions throughout the world, seeking to show the importance of supporting uh, the support of these institutions and the protection of the Amazon. The search that indigenous people have been carrying out for alliances has been constant so that life in the Amazon can be protected. In fact, it would be a lot more efficient if these large groups, large institutions from outside the Amazon help to control their neighbors, their fellow countrymen, their, so the Baniwa people, for instance, they're in the middle of the Amazon. It's not worth anything if the Baniwa people are just protect their territories, but the 
fact is we actually have a global problem. So if we indigenous people and non-indigenous people, organizations from Brazil and from all other countries, if you're going to do anything to control our influence in the destruction of the planet, it won't be worth much for the Paniwa people to get together and fight and protect their territory because the increase in temperature, the heat, uh, it's going to affect Europe and the Paniwa people the same way, even though we are not, we don't have polluting industries. So we're always fighting to make it make sure that other people understand the need for us to lower our environmental impacts. And we really hope that together with this new ministry of indigenous people, which is now a part of the Brazilian government, this debate can reach much higher relevance in Brazil and outside Brazil as well. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Singh, um, Miranda and Eliani, maybe in one minute each so we can get to our last question and then head to the Q&A um, aspect. So in one minute, could you just um, maybe highlight how we can, you know, recognize some of these actions um, of awareness or, you know, making people aware of issues in the Amazon and other territorial regions? Okay, well, in one minute. Um, I don't know if Ethan and Jacob are here, if you want to raise your hands. I have two students in the honors program that are working with me this semester. They said they were going to be here, but maybe they couldn't make it. Um, there is um, an international convention that is the ILO uh, Convention Number 169 that recognizes the right of indigenous peoples to free prior and informed consultation. Uh, I've been working with a few students on mapping the network of uh, organizations that are supporting indigenous uh, communities in creating consultation protocols for them to fight for the right for free prior informed consultation in their territories whenever there are um, projects and enterprises uh, taking place in these territories. The fight for um, free prior informed consultation is one of the only fights uh, that has gotten traction in international courts and in domestic courts that indigenous groups have um, succeeded in, in halting uh, very devastating projects such as mining, mining projects and dams. They don't do it all the time, they, they don't do it as much as they want, but it is one of the biggest tools that uh, most many indigenous groups around the world have been using to, to fight for, for their rights to protect their territories. I would suppose that the more we can engage um, our local governments and federal governments towards uh, signing on to that convention and uh, having that convention be enforced in the countries of where these industries are coming from. If, we, if Germany was to sign this convention and then force all German mining companies and, and enterprises to abide by that convention, regardless of where these transnational corporations operate, Indigenous peoples around the world would be much better off if we could have a way of enforcing transnational companies to, to follow this international convention. So I'll keep it at that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good. You have a very good <laughs> suggestion. I, I will just bring another aspect. I think we are all very interested on uh, in what is happening in the Amazon. It's all very, very important. But what about the indigenous here? So what about the environmental policies here? So I think we all live in cities, right? Like we can engage better in actions in, in where we live. So I would recommend to look for the history here. What has been done? What are, what are the social uh, and environmental policies that take place here? Are they lacking here? So that would be my recommendation because knowing what is happening in our garden might be uh, something more concrete than trying to do something in the Amazon. It's a good idea. It's just another suggestion besides yours. <laughs> Thank you. And um, finally, Daniel Singh, 
uh, what would you say is your role as an artist in, you know, drawing more awareness to this subject and um, using it as a means to express your thoughts and grievances, obviously? Um, so, in one minute, please. <laughs> Well, as an artist, I understand art as a means of communication, just like indigenous movements and indigenous organizations can communicate the desires and demands of the populations in relation to their rights and to environmental rights. Indigenous artists also have this power of communication through this this type of communication, which is art, which reaches us so intimately, it reaches our feelings. So I think art is able to really move our feelings in a way that maybe an, an organization communicate can do, or maybe uh, words in a, in a webinar can read. So me and other indigenous artists have been trying to carry out a sort of translation of our indigenous world so that Western people can understand our reality, our desires, and also our own way of thinking, our way of understanding life. And for me, art has been a very important tool for this kind of communication and this kind of awareness building for uh, different peoples. Thank you, Daniel Singh. Do you have anything else to add? I am not an artist. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, we would move to the Q&A session now. And um, do we have anyone in the live? Um, do we do the live audience? Okay. Anyone with questions? Any questions? We should have questions. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I guess first of all, like thank you all, the three of you, for taking your time. I guess this is more of a question for Dr. Miranda. Um, I'm I'm like from Ecuador, and like everything you said, I agree. I think our main problem, at least I'm talking about South America, is how corrupt our governments are. <laughs> So my question would be, sometimes as a student, I do want to do like a lot of environmental justice and like advocate for indigenous tribes. And I would love to go back to Ecuador or Brazil, anywhere. I don't, I don't, I'm not picky. But how can we fight these governments? Like how can we work with them? Because I have this idea that once you project yourself with like something against what the government's trying to do, like if you tell them like, no, we want to make these type of rules, they immediately close up. I think you have to always find like a balance. How can we work with them so they can like help us out and help the indigenous tribes? Because I really want to work with them, like do something about it. I love easy questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> How can we engage with corrupt governments in Latin America to fight for indigenous justice? <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, um, all right. Uh, it is. It, it, it's laughable because it isn't. Uh, it, it's 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 the challenge of, of our lives of our generations. Um, Latin America is the most violent place in the world for environmentalists. This is where most of us are killed and murdered and suffer death threats. Uh, it is um, especially um, dire for everybody that's on the front line, all the indigenous groups and the environmentalists that are working in the field. Uh, there are some other countries in the world that are also very uh, violent against um, environmentalists, um, but Latin American countries are always on the top ten and have been for decades. Uh, it's a tough, it's a tough job. Um, I, I think that there's, there's two things in your question that would be helpful for us to separate. One is how is it that we deal with corruption and how can we mitigate that? 
and the other is how can we do environmental justice. Of course, they're interconnected, um, but one is not fully within the other. Uh, there are places that don't have much corruption and still are very unjust from a social and ecological perspective. Um, and, they're, and, and, and corruption is something that goes beyond the injustices that we see in, in um, environmental and um, ecological things. On the fight for corruption, um, there are, well, how does corruption happen? Corruption happens when there's not transparency and uh, when it, it becomes possible. Oh, am I putting the microphone too close to my face? I realized that uh, there was a suggestion there for people not to do that. And I'll, I just, for the first time now, I thought that the microphone might be too close to my face. I'm sorry. Um, so corruption. Uh, corruption happens when we don't have enough transparency. Uh, it happens when we do not have enough accountability. So there's several very good ideas on the table as far as what is it that we can do as civil society, as voters, as journalists, as students, as activists, in order to push for more measures in our wonderful Latin American countries that have been mired by corruption but should not be defined by it. Um, that uh, would be measures that would increase transparency and accountability and would decrease corruption. And that can be done at the legislative le level, it can, can be done at the police level, it can be done at the environmental monitoring level. As far as looking and working towards um, environmental justice and working with indigenous groups and other traditional communities, and, and we are so fortunate and we should be so proud that Latin America is one of the most diverse places in the world as far as indigenous cultures and traditional communities go. Uh, I would say my, my perspective has been to just follow their lead. They are the ones that have been uh, telling us how is it that they have been fighting this Western colonial system that has been around them for hundreds of years and they know much better about what it means to do resistance and what it means to practice self-care and to practice justice in a system that is pretty oppressive. Um, and, and learning from indigenous and traditional communities has been inspiring, humbling, um, rejuvenating, um, and everything that keeps me going. <laughs> so thank you. I hope that this is... I know it's not satisfying, but I hope it's enough to answer the question. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Okay, we have one person here and then Chloe. Okay. Um, so I have a question. I do believe that art as a means of communication is extremely important. But as an artist, uh, what strategies have you noticed from those opposing your perspective? Uh, and what strategies would you recommend in countering that message? Uh, Danielson, that question is for you. talk about a current project of mine, which is organizing the community to carry out works of art in art institutions in Brazil that talk about the meaning of community and the meaning of how we build green places and places where we produce food inside cities. My last project in the Sao Paulo Biennial was a corn uh, crop that we planted. It was not transgenic. It was our own Creole seeds by the, actually, that were used by the people of Sao Paulo, the Guarani people in Sao Paulo. So this little uh, plot of land is a 
way to show non-indigenous people that it is possible. If we get together, it's possible for us to produce our own food and share this as a community. So there's this meaning of production based on indigenous ways of thinking. Another uh, project of mine, I uh, together with some in different indigenous communities, we have presented the ways in which we can organize ourselves socially to produce uh, power, and, uh, to, uh, electrical power, and also to produce energy and other types of non-Western thinking so that we can understand our the way that we participate in the world. Maybe my work is very much connected to Brazilian reality, but I see other indigenous artists throughout the world who also carry out this kind of exercise that art can be a way to get communities together, indigenous communities to come together and show a wider public that it is possible to change a local reality. I don't know if changing a change of global reality, I mean, that's a little bit on the scope, but it's possible for us to change our communities and the way that we produce food and that we consume uh, uh, power and energy. Thank you, Daniel Sen. Um, before I ask the last question from the audience, I want to know if um, there are any questions on the webinar. Do we have any questions? No questions. Okay, so any last questions? Okay. Thank you so much for being here, and it is really an honor to, to meet all of you. Um, and um, I, I guess I'll end with a question of going back to art. And um, I am a non-Indigenous artist, and um, I'm wondering what kinds of strategies um, you could recommend uh, for non-Indigenous artists to lift up these ideas and to lift up um, communities uh, indigenous communities and indigenous uh, ways of thinking um, without without appropriating them. Um, that's a sort of that's something I've been engaging with for a couple of years. Just trying to think, well, how do I situate myself in this in a way that I can lift this up without, you know, without putting myself at the center. Daniel said. Okay. Uh, okay, this question, it's not an easy question to answer because there are so many different answers and they're all correct and they're all wrong. Because there are so many different peoples, indigenous peoples, and each community has their understanding of alliances, of partnerships, and the representation of their cultures by themselves and by others. It's really hard to answer uh, this question with a recipe or a formula. What I and other indigenous uh, artists recommend is that if you feel the need to or the desire to talk about uh, another uh, an indigenous culture the first step is to reach out to them and talk to them and ask what that community or that indigenous person wishes as, as an alliance with, with another person who's not indigenous, whether they're an activist, an artist, or has another occupation. The first step is reach out and ask how they want to be represented. So for me, as as a male, I can't uh, represent a, a woman's body or thought 
or another gender without reaching out and asking, without having a dialogue, establishing a friendship, establishing an understanding with the other person. So before thinking about representing the other, one must listen to the other. One must understand what their needs are and, and if their needs are being met by what I'm offering. Uh, just like Miranda said, beautiful quotes. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Danielson. Thank you, Miranda and Eliani. Um, I'll give the microphone to Jillian now. Okay, Elizabeth. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>